Howdy, folks. What's up, Norms? Went for a walk earlier. You gonna be quiet? Or you gonna bark at nothing? How are we doing today, folks? Good. There we go. That was resounding. Anybody? Doing good. Went for a walk, barked at nothing four or five times. Helped me come up with that really horrible idea for extra credit. No, you didn't do anything like that. All right. You guys have any questions before we, you know, kind of start everything going in a few moments? Bree, are you safe? It currently looks like you're in the Blair Witch Project. I hope she's muted. We can't even hear her scream. Yeah, I know, Tinks. I hear you. I just don't care. Yes, Norms. There you go. Put your bony butt on me. All right, folks. So let's go ahead and get things going. All right, folks, so uh, any questions, comments, concerns before we start going? Nothing? All right, so you guys were asking for extra credit. I came up with a horrible idea. So here's the basic idea. It's up there on Blackboard now. You get to try to do it once. Tori, are you and Bree both petting your cat? That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> you wouldn't leave me alone. <laughs> yeah. Tinks, yeah. She's, she'll probably show up again at some point. Okay, so you guys can see my screen, right? Yes? Okay. Yeah. So basic idea here, guys, is you're going to go – Take something like this and you're going to break it down piece by piece by piece by piece. Okay. Now, this is meant to be incredibly hard to do, but the key is it has a scaling for your extra credit. So the first part you get nothing for, but then as you do more and more, you can get even more points. So once you get to effectively 15 physiological outputs that make sense, that you're going to go ahead and get extra credit for it. So, for example, you know, let's say you were going to go ahead and you can always just use the power of Google and see what it comes up with. So, let's go ahead and I'll open a new tab and say, and what do we have here? Nothing that can help you. Okay who has the highest, blah, blah, blah. But instead, what you could go ahead and do is just, sorry, I can't see what I'm typing due to this being in the frame. Yeah, that's definitely not how you spell weight. And it even helps me by saving. Okay, good. So congratulations, you've got the first two things down. 62220. Now, go back up, you got height and weight. Now, VO2 max, stroke volume, cardiac output. Okay, so now you're looking for an example of effectively how much aerobic work that person can do. Well, you figure max heart rate, technically Captain America is, well,
Do this again. So 27, so technically 93. So his max heart rate probably wouldn't be that high, but at the end of it, you can say 27 because of on ice and then however long it is in there. So you've got the age that you can then go ahead and figure out 220 minus the age gives a max heart rate of approximately 193 beats per minute. Now, if you watch the movie and you see him running, for example, the one scene, I think it's in the second film, where he's doing some long distance running, you get an extrapolation of how fast he's moving, figuring that's gotta be pretty close to his VO2 max. And then if that's gonna be how much he happened to be doing relative to his body weight, you can ballpark this using information that we've already got in the class. Now for stroke volume, then you're gonna go ahead and figure out, well, you need to have that cardiac output based upon the Fick equation, which we're still breathing air that only has so much oxygen. So you're only able to extract so much air from it. And because of that, well, in order to make up that total cardiac output for that amount of oxygen that's being pumped around per beat, we then can also infer the stroke volume. Now resting heart rate, if you figure out his stroke volume, then from there you can figure out, okay, well, how many times would that heart have to beat per minute in order to get that many liters around the body? Now peak power and peak power relative to the body weight, you're just looking for something that's a high power movement. For example, whenever he jumps for maximal height, throws something for maximal distance, you can infer, thanks to biomechanics, how far that's moving, and then from there, go and divide it by body weight. This is meant to be really, really difficult, but it'll be kind of fun because if you figure out the strength to body weight ratio, okay, you can then figure out the strength to cross-sectional area. Now, human muscle tissue, I think it's you, each myosin head can produce, I think it's about seven to 10 uh, pico, Newtons of force, and it, should, it only scales up to a certain extent. So you can figure out how big in theory, well, you can guess what his muscle sizes are, but then how big they'd actually really need to be in order to have that level of strength. So once again, this is meant to be brutally difficult, but also to hopefully have a little bit of fun with it. Because I know a lot of you guys are asking for extra credit and be careful what you ask for. So notice guys, the first five points aren't worth anything. The next four are only worth one. So this is one of those, if you really want to get a lot out of it, you got to go the distance and you can only do it once. So, but this is up there online for you now. So you guys can go ahead and give it a shot whenever you're ready. Okay. So any other questions before we start talking about adaptations to exercise? No? All right. So keep in mind, just like we talked about in chapter nine, specificity. We're always going to be adapting to the demands placed upon the body. Whatever energy system we happen to be utilizing the most, that's the one that's going to have the greatest amount of adaptation. And not just the energy system, but the energy system in those muscle fibers we're recruiting. Now, what are the two parts of the cardiovascular system that adapt generally to any form of aerobic training? the heart and the blood vessels. Remember, the blood vessels are specific to the muscles you're using. The heart and the blood are the two that are, in general, going to adapt to training. But we're only going to get those capillarization changes through, remember, anastomoses, interceptions, sprouting. That's only occurring specifically to the muscles that we're using for the exercise. So. We've talked a little bit about aerobic endurance. It's really what can you maintain for a really, really long period of time. And as you'd figure, if we increase your VO2 max, how much oxygen you're able to take in and utilize, you're going to be able to perform at a higher level in a typical aerobic endeavor. Now, we're going to find that as you get to be in better, better shape, submaximal endurance is going to improve. So you're not going to have to use as high of a heart rate at the same given work output. And this is going to allow you to keep up that performance for even longer. Now, what can you guys think of would be an example in sport where you'd have consistent submaximal endurance performance and you want it to become easier with time? I'd say like cross country running, some kind of endurance running like that. 
True. True. And then also you're getting into some like anaerobic threshold, but think about sports that have a big aerobic component. So think of like, think of soccer, think of basketball. If you're in better aerobic shape, you effectively can still jog back down the court, jog back down the field and be recovering. If you're not as in good of aerobic shape, that jogging is still going to have you at a higher heart rate. So you're not able to recover or you're not able to even to keep up that speed. Okay. Now what's going to happen with training? Well, it turns out we're going to go ahead and increase our heart size which in turn is going to increase our stroke volume because now we got a bigger left ventricle, so it's going to pump more blood per beat, which means that we'll have a lower submaximal heart rate, a lower resting heart rate, but our maximal heart rate is probably going to stay the same. It might go down a little bit, but that's okay and that's normal. Our overall cardiac output is going to go up, which in turn means we're going to increase our blood flow. Our blood pressure should probably stay about the same. It might improve if we had a higher blood pressure ahead of time. And our overall blood volume is going to increase. So the first thing that's going to increase is our blood plasma level and then from there the next thing that's going to increase is going to be our hematocrit aka we're going to have more red blood cells thanks to the hormone erythropoietin so speaking of the extra credit opportunity when we're looking at how much oxygen we're transporting to tissues we're looking at what's known as the Fick equation so the total amount of oxygen we're using equals our stroke volume multiplied by our heart rate so our cardiac output and then that AVO2 difference. So how much oxygen were we able to actually go ahead and get out of the red blood cells as it passed through the capillaries around the exercising muscle? Now, the heart size is going to go ahead and improve with training. It turns out it's going to be related to whatever stimulus we have applying on the body. And so if we're looking at the graph on the right, notice that we're looking at uh, left ventricular inter inner diameter, we've got medium uh, wall thickness, and then we have left ventricular mass. So doing any style of training is going to go ahead and increase your heart size, but those that have an aerobic component, and then an aerobic component where they don't have the body weight relative force development, aka cycling, they have typically the greatest performance. Now when it says volume loading effect on the heart, your heart works effectively against two different forms of resistance when it comes to training. One is volume load, the other is pressure load. Volume load is we need to literally pump more blood around the body, so that's increasing the cardiac output. Pressure load, the second of the two, is the body or the heart has to work against a higher pressure. So this is an example when you're doing heavy weight training, where you're doing the Valsalva maneuver, which is increasing your blood pressure. So your body has to go against a greater amount of resistance. Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing in the acute, but like anything else, if that's long-term, because we've got some other metabolic issues and abnormalities, that can lead ourselves into disease states. Now, what we're going to see is, in general, our stroke volume is going to increase thanks to training meaning we're going to have a better resting stroke volume and a better maximal stroke volume. Norbs, we live in the suburbs. Suburbs. Sorry. So we're going to see that the total amount of stroke volume that you're going to have the increasement, increasing of is going to be relative to how well trained you are beforehand. And specifically, you're going to have a greater amount of adaptation when you're younger. So specifically, the best age to get into a lot of aerobic style training is actually going to be when you're still a teenager, before you've gone through puberty, before your body has really hit its manager of growth spurt and otherwise, because that's when we see the greatest amount of adaptability. Now, you still have adaptability as you get older. It just happens to be a smaller and smaller amount of what you happen to have before. Now, if you look at the table in the corner, notice, guys, how we have an increase in stroke volume from levels of training from being untrained, moderately trained to maximum to elite level training, that we can literally have a high level athlete at rest <clears throat> pumps more blood per beat than a sedentary individual 
does at maximal output. That's how big of a difference in stroke volume you can get from long and consistent training. Now, your resting heart rate is going to go down. The reason for that is because we have an increased stroke volume, so we don't have to have as high of a heart rate in order to match that resting cardiovascular output. Part of it also is due to changes in your autonomic nervous system, that we have a greater amount of parasympathetic tone, and we've got a lower amount of epinephrine and norepinephrine response. Now, when we say submaximal heart rate is going to go down, that means at a given workload, so this could be that walking at two miles an hour, followed by four miles an hour, followed by jogging at six miles an hour, as you go from being untrained to trained to well-trained, you're going to see that the heart rates required to do each of those is going to be going downwards. Now, we're not going to see much of a change in that maximal heart rate because it turns out that's more limited by your physiology and the size of your heart along with, obviously, your overall health of your heart. Not that your health goes down that rapidly as you get older, but obviously it is a contributing factor, the reason why we're not going to see as high of a maximal heart rate. Now, we're going to see an interesting little reaction of, or interaction between our heart rate and our stroke volume, which is, yes, the heart rate goes down, stroke volume goes up, but is the antithesis true? Well, it turns out your body's always trying to optimize your cardiac output. And we're gonna see that maximal stroke volume is usually hit at somewhere between 120 beats per minute, all the way up to maybe 170, 180 for very, very well-trained individuals. So the first major increase in cardiac output, aside from your heart rate going up, is mostly coming from stroke volume changes. Now, once we've gotten all the changes out of the stroke volume that we can, then we're getting all the changes beyond that from increasing the heart rate. And on top of that, what's really good about using the heart rate is it'll let us know how quickly someone can recover from doing hard metabolic work. Meaning, if we are able to get our heart rate to come back down faster after exercise, that's a really good indication we have a better aerobic system that is able to much more rapidly recover from the stress that we just put on the body. On top of that, it turns out our cardiac output, because we have that greater stroke volume, but we still have that same maximal heart rate, in all in all, is going to definitely go up thanks to training. Now, when we're talking about aerobic style training, we are going to be doing a much better job of sending blood flow or blood to the muscle that we're training. Now, this is going to help us increase our capillary number by recruiting them, so we do a better job of basically dilating to them along with we're going to once again have that branching, have that sprouting, that interception, that in turn is going to give a greater amount of total capillaries per cross-sectional area, so we have a better amount of gas exchange between the exercising tissue and the blood in the body. We're gonna do a better job of vasoconstricting to the areas that do not need that blood flow, and then remember overall, we're going to see a greater amount of blood volume. So if you look at the table, folks, you're going to see the total number of capillaries and specifically the fiber to ratio, uh, sorry, fiber, capillary to fiber ratio is going to improve in individuals that happen to be well-trained, which is going to allow for a greater amount of blood flow. Now, it's really interesting, guys. If you look over at the far right, you see the diffusion distance. Now, this is literally how far effectively oxygen and carbon or and carbon dioxide has to diffuse across whenever we're looking at the body and those individual fibers. Now, another argument for limitations on literally how big your muscles can get is the amount of capillary blood flow to the area, which is if you only have a finite amount of oxygen, which you do, it can only transport so far in order to keep the general overall health in the architecture of those individual fibers going. So your fibers can only be literally so big with a certain amount of blood flow. And so if we don't have better blood flow to those muscles, we're going to naturally be limited on how big we can get them. Now, this doesn't mean everyone needs to be a long distance runner who also lifts weights, but we do need to keep in mind, we should probably be doing something in order to enhance our capillarization to those muscles that we are looking to hypertrophy. Another component to keep in mind when it comes to that hypertrophy is sometimes to talk about nuclear domain, and that's when we talk about how we have multinucleated individual muscle fibers, and literally each nuclei can only produce so much protein at a certain speed. 
So if the muscle was too big for only one little nuclei, it's not gonna be able to be able to literally build the proteins fast enough to replace the ones that are breaking down. So it's that same basic idea of us being finite and needing enough resources to literally have the upkeep of that tissue in order to keep it going. Now, when it comes to blood pressure, turns out we're probably gonna have lower blood pressure in general when we're talking about aerobic style training. Now, this is because we're gonna do a better job of vasodilation, hence that lower diastolic blood pressure, but we're also gonna have still as high if not higher stroke volume and specifically the systolic blood pressure because now the heart can pump with much more force than it could. Now that's during exercise. At rest, individuals that are very well trained typically are gonna have normal, possibly even slightly lower blood pressure just because it turns out they don't have to have as much force at rest to ship all of that blood around the body, once again, partially due to the autonomic nervous system. Now, notice the blood volume in that it's going to increase. Now, initially, this is due to increasing the total volume of plasma. This is because we're gonna be retaining more water, we're gonna have more albumin, more electrolytes. Then, thanks to erythropoietin and signaling throughout the body, we're going to be increasing our red blood cell number, which is gonna increase our red blood cell volume, but overall, this is gonna decrease our plasma viscosity, literally meaning there's less resistance to pumping this blood around our body. However, at the same time, we have slightly lower oxygen carrying capacity per unit of blood, but we're more than making up with it for being able to pump more blood around because of the less resistance. Now, if you understand this slide, you understand all of the adaptations that you're getting from doing chronic aerobic style training. I thoroughly suggest taking your time, going through it, and making sure that you're understanding how one influences the next and influences the next. Okay, These are all the things that we've already talked about before in a variety of different ways, but this is how effectively they're all flowing together. Now, well, what's going on with the respiratory system? Well, it turns out we're probably going to be breathing a little bit less with intensity at lower, at any submax work because it turns out we're not having as great of a demand because we're able to pump more blood around. So our carrying capacity is going to be a little bit better there. However, at maximal, we're probably going to have an increase because we actually are doing a better job of fully utilizing our lungs, having actually literally a more well-trained diaphragm along with our secondary breathing muscles. Now, we're not really gonna see much of a difference in that diffusion of oxygen across the membranes, maybe a little bit at maximal exercise because we got better perfusion throughout the entire of the lung. Because remember, thanks to gravity, the top third of the lungs are poorly diffused at rest. The middle is, the middle one third is okay, but the lower third has really great diffusion just due to the effects of gravity pulling the blood down lower. Now, the AVO2 difference is actually gonna increase. We're gonna do a much better job of pulling the oxygen out of the blood and getting it into the muscle where it's needed. And so this is going to lead for a greater capacity because we're literally using more oxygen relative to unit of blood that's being transported around the body. Now, what are we gonna see as far as changes in the muscle? You might see an increase in muscle fiber size uh, not necessarily going to happen too much. You're definitely going to see a shifting of those fiber types from more of the 2X and the 2A, 2A to the type 1, depending on hybrid. And then even our pure 2A or potentially our pure 2X are going to serve to take on more characteristics of type 1 muscle fibers with increased mitochondria number, increased number of enzymes related to aerobic performance. We've already talked about how we're going to be increasing our capillaries, which is going to be a big component for being able to keep up this output along with we're gonna be increasing that oxygen carrying protein inside of the muscle known as myoglobin, which is going to do a better job of extracting oxygen from the bloodstream and then bringing it to the mitochondria so it can be used as the final electron acceptor of the electron transport chain. Now, not only do you increase the size of your mitochondria, but you increase their number. This is a great thing because literally we have more aerobic powerhouses and their bigger generators in the first place. Now, this is going to be very much so related to the total amount of training volume. So if you're doing a greater amount of work, you're going to see <clears throat> a greater amount of magnitude of change. <coughs> Excuse me, folks. 
Now, you're also going to see an increase in the enzymes that are related to aerobic metabolism. So succinate, dehydrogenate, and citrate synthase are both enzymes related to the citric acid cycle. When they increase in number, they're going to allow for the enzymatic rate or essentially the breakdown or the utilization of that energy system to go up. And that's a good thing because it literally means we're going to do a better job of utilizing aerobic metabolism. Now, aerobic metabolism is not just only utilizing carbohydrates as fuel. Remember, it's also utilizing fats as a fuel and to a very, very minimal extent, protein. So if we're able to do a better job of just simply sparing our glycogen, we're going to see a better aerobic performance in general from our athlete, along with, it turns out, we're going to be able to keep up a higher work rate. Now, what's going on as far as the difference between doing HIIT training and so on? Well, or, so let me introduce what HIIT training is. High intensity interval training. It turns out you're gonna do something of a very high intensity brief rest and then repeat it again. Now, this has become very popular in recent date. You can look at things like um, CrossFit, boot, uh, burn boot camps, et cetera, where they really try to utilize this as a means to potentially try to get nearly the same amount of changes physiologically, but with doing a much smaller amount of training volume. Does this work? Yes. In fact, it's going to give you nearly the same amount of performance changes that you're going to get from doing aerobic style training. So if we're looking at what's known as cytochrome oxidase, so that's COX, which is going to be increasing and showing effectively that we're doing a better job of breaking down energy aerobically, it's going to be enhanced irregardless if we're doing HIIT training or we're doing long, slow aerobic training. Now, this is a good thing for overall mitochondrial function and health. If you only have enough time to where you can just do HIIT style training, then that's fine. That's going to give you the vast majority of the aerobic adaptations you get from doing long distance style training. The key advantage of doing long distance training is one, you're going to become effectively more efficient at that movement over a long enough period of time, which is going to enhance your performance in the given sports you're trying to train for. Two, you're going to learn a little bit more about pacing and more about how to effectively perform the sport tactically than what you do if all you ever did was high intensity work. And three, your connective tissues and otherwise are going to adapt to the volume of work you need to do in order to be successful. So you can do HIIT training to be just an overall good shape. But if you're trying to be an uh, Ironman completer and or a marathoner, you are going to have to go out there and do long volume endurance style training in order to literally develop your tissues resiliency to doing that much work. Now, we're also going to see an enhancement in that lactate threshold, meaning the point of which lactate is accumulating in the blood isn't going to happen until we get to a higher percentage of our VO2 max. This is a good thing because this is the intensity that we can effectively hold without any major negative byproducts. Now, you run a maximal one mile at a little bit over your anaerobic threshold. Okay? In fact, it might even be close to your VO2 max is where you really run that. A 5K is going to be ran at typically right around someone's VO2 max, but definitely getting above that anaerobic threshold for a lot of it. Whereas when you run something like a marathon, you're actually running that typically at only 60 to 70% of your VO2 max. So you need to be able to have a really high lactate threshold so you can maintain that output for a long period of time without the accumulation of fatigue. Now, what's known as your respiratory exchange ratio, the point at which you're gonna be switching over to be utilizing from initially very high carbo or far high fat metabolism to finally going into mostly carbohydrate and then carbohydrate and anaerobic carbohydrate metabolism. The further you can push that switch up to occur, the longer period of time you're gonna be able to exercise while maintaining your glycogen stores. And that's why you typically use a much lower intensity when you do something like a marathon, because most people are going to be depleting their glycogen stores over the course of that race, especially if they happen to go out too aggressively initially when they're putting in too great of a demand for what the body can manage.
Now, we're going to see that your resting VO2, just the amount that you need in order to maintain yourself, isn't really going to change. It might go down a little bit simply because you're a lighter, smaller body if you've done a lot of aerobic style work and you started bigger. Now, as far as your submaximal VO2, that's not really going to change. It might go down, and that's once again mostly due to having lower demands because you become more efficient at the movement, and quite potentially, you become smaller, so the movement is now more efficient for you to do in general. Now, your maximal, that's going to be able to increase relatively high or uh, it could even increase by 50% or more, usually over that first six months of training. And then from there, we still might see some increases when people are training for very long periods of time. But like anything else, there tends to be a ceiling, and that's very much so dependent on things like genetics. So what we have here, guys, is just a number of different values for comparing different athletes when they happen to be, well, sorry, this is a pre to post training for someone who's sedentary, and then comparing that to a world-class athlete. Of you can see differences in the resting heart rate, stroke volume at rest, maximal stroke volume, cardiac output, and et cetera. As you suspect, someone that's very, very well trained is gonna have much, much higher levels than someone that was sedentary compared to being post-training. However, notice how much training performance was able to increase in the individual within a relatively acute exercise training period. Now, what other types of training are we going to see? Well, sadly enough, you're probably going to hit that peak VO2 in probably only about a year and a half. After that, it's all about enhancing that anaerobic threshold and getting more efficient with the movement. Now, this is heavily influenced by things like how well trained you were pre playing your sport and then genetics. Now, if you guys look at our graphs, we can see the changes in the VO2 and how you're getting the greatest amount of change within the initial part of the program, how and that's actually gonna be more predictive of how we're going to infer what someone's VO2 max is gonna be over doing graded exercise. And then notice between the change in the VO2 and the total amount of training volume. So after this person's getting up to about, just shy of 4,000 meters per day, so we're talking about running about two and a half miles to maybe three. They've already managed to get most of the magnitude of change of their VO2 max that they were able to get out of the training compared to still increasing it to where they were doing literally with 8,000 meters per day is going to convert over to about four or five miles every day. And we're still only going to be increasing a few percentage points over that relatively small volume after only month two. So what's interesting, if you're looking for a really good aerobic athlete, remember you're looking at both the baseline and then how big of a responder they are to that training when we get back to individuality. My cousin, uh, who's a cross-country coach, he literally will not recruit kids from certain high schools because he knows those coaches are already having those athletes do massive volumes. And since they're already doing massive volumes of work, they're probably not going to increase and improve that much more because it turns out they've already managed to, if you think of a sponge with water, they've not just squeezed the sponge a little, they have tried to wring out every last ounce of performance improvement, and you're looking at someone who's pretty close to their genetic ceiling, and instead he looks for programs where their coaches are a little bit more lackadaisical, they don't train the kids very intensely, and the ones that are high performers from there typically are the ones that are arguably more talented. So speaking of genetics, okay, this is going to be a major influencer. So, you know, first and foremost, if you happen to be sedentary, you're going to see a much greater change. If you happen to be very, very big, so we're talking 300, 400 pound individuals that we can shave a lot of weight off, that's going to definitely improve their VO2 max relative to body mass because they've got a slower, they've got a smaller body mass. But heredity is going to be one of the biggest factors. So if you guys look at the graph on the right side, we can see the difference between monozygous twins, dizygous twins, and non-twin brothers, which means everyone happens to have the same mom and dad. Now, obviously, monozygous meaning coming from one egg, dizygous meaning fraternal twins. We still see how everyone tends to lay pretty close to the line as far as to the metabolic performance of the one athlete to the other. You can see in certain examples how one brother is literally a much greater aerobic athlete than the other because it turns out just because you happen to share the same parents 
doesn't, much less the same womb at the same time, doesn't mean you've lived the same life and how those lifestyle choices are going to in affect their performance. But notice guys, quarter to a half of your VO2 max is simply gonna be influenced by mom and dad. So I'm sorry if you wanted to be a good aerobic uh, athlete, blame your parents for not uh, picking a better aerobic battery. And specifically, which gender is actually more important for aerobic performance? Males. Well, just remember, societally, males are more important in general. At least that's what uh, politics and otherwise seem to tell me based upon government, right? No. But in reality, it's actually women. Why is the genetics that comes from the mother more important for aerobic performance than the genetics that come from the father? I mean, the mother's providing all the nutrients right in the womb for the child. The guy's just really not nurturing the child. Well, I mean, some people are shitty parents. I do agree with that. But we're thinking about genetics, not nutrition. Not nutrition, but genetics. What's the one part of your genetics that you only got from your mother? I have no idea. That's okay. Anybody else? Because Will's kind of carrying the team right now and it's looking a little heavy on his back. Really? What's the one thing that eggs have but sperm don't when it comes to organelles i heard your receding hairline comes from your mom <laughs> was that a personal attack on my hairline or was that just a statement for the class <laughs> No, that was just in general, because I heard it came from, like, your mom's dad. So your, your X chromosome is where the, the gene for baldness comes <laughs> from, for at least the most, like, male pattern baldness? That's what I heard. As a male, you typically only have one X chromosome, so you're right. You do get that mostly from your mother. However, it's not the difference between genetics, because obviously, as a male, I got my X chromosome from my mom. I got my Y chromosome from my dad. I mean, that's kind of the only place I could have gotten the Y from. And since I didn't get an X from him, mom's one of her two is what I have. Now, the thing for you guys is the fact that sperm don't have a mitochondria. Eggs do. So your mitochondria in every single cell of your body is the exact same mitochondria that your mother has, which is the exact same mitochondria that her mother has all the way back. So that's why they utilize mitochondrial DNA to look at maternal lines. Just like for you know, those of us that are male here, we can trace our Y chromosome all the way back up through our family. So myself and my male cousins, all of us, we have the same Y chromosome because we got that from our dad. Our dad's my dad's three other brothers. They got that from our grandpa. My grandpa and his other brothers all got that from his dad. So mitochondria being the powerhouse of every single cell in your body, if you happen to have really high functioning ones as a male, you're not passing that on to the next generation because your sperm don't have it. As a female though, those mitochondria, which you got from your mother and her mother and so on, that's what you're passing on to the next generation. So that's why genetically, all of us are about 51% our mom and 49% our dad because of the mitochondrial DNA. Does that make sense? 
throw yeah. the heel pattern ball in this grace and doing the up angle. I guess that's <laughs> the down angle, you maybe you'd see a little bit more. Okay. So as you suspect, guys typically have a higher VO2 max than a female. The reason for it isn't really due to any major physiological differences. It's more or less just due to the fact that your average male typically has a lower percent body fat than your average female. And your average female is on, I, I learned this at a conference uh, before we went down in the full lockdown, women are on a monthly phlebotomy schedule. So that can sometimes cause a little bit more an, or a higher risk for anemia in women than it does in men. Now, if you guys look at the graph in the bottom right, when we talk about high responders and low responders, notice this is going to be families. So some of these families, as far as how well they adjust, they adapt to aerobic training and where they happen to be as far as the means and the averages, notice that when you get everybody together, you have some folks who just have a massive advantage aerobically, just like you're going to have some folks that have a massive disadvantage aerobically. And the center of the red dot effectively is going to be the average of the group, where they tend to lie at. And then the ends of the brackets is how far above and below that happen to be. So notice that some of those families do naturally have a higher average baseline, but how well they are going to respond or how much they respond comes down to how much they're going to train. So some folks actually have a very high baseline, but have a very small amount of adaptation. Where other folks naturally have a lower baseline, but then they have a massive amount of variation they can have thanks to training. And so your best athletes, high baseline, massive response that they can have to that training. All right, what we have here guys is just some expectations of where we would typically see a VO2 max for athletes within different areas. Now these are older values and I don't put a whole lot of stock in them, but it's just important to understand that depending on how old you are, how fit you are, you're going to have differing levels, but it's more important that you make sure that like anything else, your athlete is in shape to either play their sport or to train for their sport. That's the given key. You don't have to have that great of an aerobic battery for certain athletic endeavors and other athletic endeavors you definitely need to have a better aerobic battery in order to perform at a higher level. So, turns out being having better aerobic training for aerobic sports is a great thing. Now, it's important for obviously sports that don't involve endurance because it turns out you can recover faster and you can perform more repetitions in training and or in the sport without having a decrement in your performance. So what should we do? Well, it turns out we should go ahead and try and enhance aerobic performance. Now, what I do love is once again, this book was written by people that were more about what style of training. Anyone other than Will? Remember guys, when we talked about resistance training and the book says that you should somehow only take one minute rest between each set of maximal weight training? Oh yeah, and you said they've never lifted in their life? They never lifted anything heavy enough that it mattered. If your dumbbells come in a color that's, uh, let's say pink, fuchsia, <laughs> or neon, you haven't ever done a hard enough work where it's like, oh damn, you should probably just like sit down for a few minutes and get your breath back. Now. So they're very big aerobophiles. Now here's the thing. What's the problem? You know, obviously we're very much so outside of the norm right now, but you know, picking on Brie, picking, actually, yeah, we'll pick on Brie because she was a goalie. Brie, if we were going to have you train like a midfielder, we we're just going to have you run for miles and miles and miles every single day, aside from possibly increasing your risk of injury, what's the thing that you're not practicing enough when it comes to playing soccer? I mean, your skill set. Yeah, I hear like being a goalie is actually being able to be a goalie, not just, you know, trying to run miles and miles and miles. So when it, we talk about maximizing cardiorespiratory endurance, guys, in order to really 
increase your aerobic style or your aerobic performance, most folks are gonna have to do probably three, if not all the way up to five aerobic style training sessions per week. Now, if each of these sessions, because you're doing old school, long, slow distance, happens to be closer to an hour, that's five hours that you're not practicing goaltending. That's five hours that you're not practicing your pitch and softball. That's five hours that you're not practicing the skills really important for your sport. So by saying all athletes benefit from maximizing cardiovascular, cardiorespiratory endurance, think back guys to that serpentine graph where once we're at that top part, we don't need to really worry about enhancing aerobic performance. It's in that midline and the bottom. That's where we really want to go ahead and spend some time and some energy on increasing aerobic capacity. So we're going to be able to perform more repetitions in training and we're going to be able to recover. And then other sports, if you think about American style football, if we try to make all of our linemen do long distance, aside from dear God, the amount of stress fractures and the trail of tears you'd have, what's another issue with having people do large volumes of aerobic work? Is it working more of like the slow twitch muscles instead of like the fast twitch muscles that they'll actually like need in the game? That is a good one, especially that's a very good point, Gracie, in that you're not doing a good job of staying within specificity. And what I was leaning more towards is the simple reality of it costs a lot of calories. If you're doing a lot of volume of aerobic work and you're doing a lot of sport training, it's really hard for some athletes to keep their weight on. So if you've got a football player, a basketball player, uh, even a soccer player that's having a hard time keeping weight on, and then you're going to have them do big volumes of aerobic work, are they going to be able to maintain that body mass? So it's, there's nothing wrong with having a big aerobic component and especially having a good idea of how good a shape does your athlete need to be in. So for certain sports, whenever they do, I know softball, you guys told us about your test where you guys have to do the 100s. Yeah, I'm not the biggest fan, but you know, we all make our own choices. I know with uh, soccer, it's the uh, beep test. At least if someone has just enough aerobic capacity to play the sport, anything beyond that might help perform, increase performance a little bit, but typically, we're always going to be effectively as strong as our biggest weakness. And so whatever that happens to be as a coach, as a trainer, as a physician, that's what you're trying to go ahead and fix. You're not trying to fix and make their strengths even stronger. You're trying to make sure that they don't have an Achilles heel. So as far as that anaerobic training, well, it turns out we're going to be increasing that power in that effectively one second to two minute rate. We can use the wind gate as a way to test it. It sucks, but it works. And it turns out we're going to increase this really quickly thanks to doing training. Now, this is gonna be adapting obviously different muscle fibers because of what we're tapping into. Specifically, now we're really affecting those type 2A and type 2X fibers. And over a long enough period of time, we're gonna see that shifting from less of the type ones more into the type two fibers in the muscles that we happen to be utilizing that area. Now, we're going to see not really much of a change in our ATP PCR system through increasing the amount of creatine kinase. Now we can utilize a little bit or increase our creatine stores. Now, part of that is due to just the demands in the body. And then sometimes you can use supplementation to further saturate and increase your total amount of creatine that you can store in order to have a greater amount of energy in that training or in that set uh, in that system for our aerobic glyco or sorry anaerobic glycolytic system we're going to see an increase in pfk lactate dehydrogenase hexokinase the major enzymes that are important to being rate limiting steps in that energy system now we're going to see an increase in these areas also corresponding to an increase in strength. So when we're working with athletes, we do need to keep in mind the amount of volume of work and the intensity we're at is going to be influencing how big of a change you're going to see. So notice in the six second to 30 second group, the 30 second group has a greater increase in enzyme activity 
specifically we're talking about anaerobic metabolism so that we're going to have a greater amount of performance. And then as far as that pre to post training, we're going to see in general just a slight in, or a general overall improvement in how much power we're going to do irregardless. Now, we do need to keep in mind specificity. We all tend to be better aerobically at the sport or activity that we happen to do the most of. So, you know, the VO2 video is somebody walking on a treadmill into jogging. Why do we pick that? Because hopefully everybody is walking every single day or they're at least doing some form of cardiovascular work. Now, if we were going to have someone try to do a VO2 max through swimming, if you don't have anywhere near of as good of efficiency, it's going to rank you as having much poor aerobic fitness. So when you look all the way at the graph on the right side again, notice in that elite rower, male, the green dot at about 75 uh, milliliters of oxygen per kilogram per minute of you know, mass and time. Notice that when just doing the same VO2 max, but now uphill uh, treadmill running, that guy literally had a VO2 max of less than 65. It literally shaved over 10 points off his VO2 max, which since no less than 100, we're talking about dropping your performance down by about 15%. So if you only tested your rower through doing a treadmill test, you'd say that he has horrible rower performance. But in reality, it's because we're not being specific. So what we want to do is make sure that we're developing the aerobic component needed for that athlete as specifically as we can. Cross training is the idea that we're going to use different modalities to try and increase the performance overall and or still get some performance in one specific area. Now, you are going to see that if you're doing aerobic style training, your strength improvements from resistance training are not going to be the same meaning you're probably going to have 70 to 90% of the ch changes you would have had otherwise. But the funny thing is endurance performance is not blunted by strength training. So you're still going to be increasing aerobic component, plus you're not going to look as small and weak from doing it. Now, the key with cross training is to make sure we're picking something that's going to be as close as possible. So for example, obviously right now due to social distancing, Turns out you probably shouldn't be playing the sport of basketball with other people. What could you do for cross training that's going to probably have a much higher specificity for the sport of basketball? Maybe some like short shuttle runs or sprints. Yeah. Or you could just take a ball out on the court and just work on, you know, different types of dribbling up and down the court. You right, create some type of fartlek where you could go ahead and have something somewhat similar to the sport of basketball. Or you could maybe have them try to do something like tennis or otherwise where they're able to run, change direction, but then now we're getting into how well skilled you are in that given endeavor. You could be looking at something like trail running, so where they have to do a lot of change of direction, but you're still trying to modulate it along the lines of the time that they would have to be doing that performance in. And then when it comes to uh, other modalities, what would be probably a really bad choice as a means to try to get somebody in shape for basketball? Strictly. Running like long distance, sorry, Gracie. No, you're good. I was thinking like strictly just um, strength training, like not any like running. Hmm. Well, to be fair, if you lift weights heavy enough and fast enough, you'll get a pretty good uh, cardiovascular component. If any of you guys have a little bit of weights there and you are losing your mind, you want something to do, uh, Google Javorek complexes, J-A-V-O-R-E-K, Istvan Javorek. Uh, and you just, if you can go through the cycle one with, uh, two 50 pound dumbbells, you're in, you're in pretty good shape. You can go through the long cycle with 50 pound dumbbells and you send me a video of you doing that. I'll buy you lunch whenever we all see each other again. Okay. You can have one item off the McDonald's dollar menu, whatever you like, but 
you're right, weight training might not be the best, but then think about something like swimming. Yeah, it might help with total over, overall body, but you're not getting the same aerobic adaptations where you really need it, which is in the legs. And then we could look at the differences between, let's say they're gonna try to do skating compared to biking, compared to riding an elliptical for aerobic performance. Well, turns out the skating is probably your worst option. The cycling, probably the second best, maybe the best, depending on perspective. And then the elliptical, since it's a little more total overall body, even though it's still straight line, might be your best of those options. So just keep in mind, especially right now, where we have to find a way to make things work uh, without the uh, typical amount of equipment that most teams would be able to utilize in order to keep up performance. Now, as far as looking at those enzyme changes, guys, look at the total amount you're gonna see in the oxidative system, ATP, PCR, and the glycolytic system, thanks to individuals that are doing more anaerobic or aerobic style training, where we can see things being upticked or downticked because the body is always trying to adapt specifically to the demands that we're placing upon it. So, yep, and we've already gone through this before. I have no idea why I put this slide in here twice. What questions, comments, concerns do you guys have for me when it comes to adaptations to both the aerobic and the anaerobic side metabolically from doing a large volume of work? I did have one question you were mentioning uh, almost in the beginning of the lecture, talking about as you're training your anaerobic system, you're becoming more efficient and you know, incorporating or something about the muscle fibers. I'm just, I guess the question would be, are you directly increasing gains in strength as well? Or just uh, with, with your aerobic training or just kind of becoming more efficient, how quickly they can recover? Because I'm wondering, like, would you improve in strength as well, like with just endurance training? So everything is relative to where you start. So if I was to get hardcore into long distance training, which full transparency, guys, I went for a run on Saturday. I felt dirty the entire time I did it. I'm not proud of what I did. The only thing that made me happy is whenever I was jogging, I literally was running faster than two different actual long distance runners, mostly due to the shame. And then second, because of social distancing. So I wanted to make sure I was kept six feet from them. Um, but in reality, if I was to go just really aggressively in aerobic training, I would definitely see a decrease in maximal strength. Uh, I've literally done a full marathon once in my life that I've done a number of half marathons. Um, anytime I've legitimately trained for them, um, my maximal strength and things like the back squat and the deadlift goes down simply because of all the amount of fatigue that's being generated. And it's really hard for my body to recover from all that work. Now, whereas if you were to take someone who's completely sedentary, someone that hasn't been able to do anything, and then you have them start picking up something like cycling, long distance running, et cetera, they're going to see not just an increase in the aerobic performance, but they'll actually see an increase in strength because they're now doing more work than they've ever done beforehand, which is not just increasing the aerobic capacity of their muscles, but the contractile strength and possibly leading to some hypertrophy. Does that make sense? But then again, it also comes down to the system, okay? For myself, um, did I, I tell you guys I finally found a decent hill to go run, right? I don't believe so. Oh, so you guys ever been out to the Taylor Fork area that's past the Woodship Trail on the EKU campus? Mm, I've been on the Woodship Trail. I don't know about that Taylor Fork. Okay, so instead of going back on the Woodship Trail, go on the gravel road all the way until it comes to a gate. You can open the gate because it's just a little clip. It's not actually like a lock. Hmm. Then it is a like hill that it took me, because uh, I, I timed myself to figure out if it's long enough. It took me about 50 seconds to go from the bottom to the top wearing cleats uh, running up it. So aside from feeling like, yeah, being a little tired, uh, like that's a really good metabolic stressor. And it's obviously, yes, it's hitting very heavily in the anaerobic uh, energy systems. 
but by doing enough volume where I'll sprint up, walk down, sprint up, walk down, my heart rate will be elevated. So it is kind of like a high intensity interval training. So it's gonna give you a number of the benefits, but also just due to physics and running up a hill as opposed to going flat ground or down, it actually has less impact on the joints. But the major issue, and I want you guys to take a wild guess. Anytime I start getting into long distance running, of all the muscles involved in, in distance running, which of them do you think I have the greatest amount of soreness in? So now think more bio, uh, biomechanics, specifically kinesiology, the muscles you're utilizing in running. I mean, I'm definitely thinking your leg muscles. Is it something deeper like your respiratory muscles or something? No, nope. thankfully I've never had diaphragmatic soreness. That would be pretty bad. But no, no, no. Think about which specific muscle. Because turns out for the lower body, I train my lower body for the most part pretty hard. So I rarely have any soreness in most muscles in the lower body, except for technically two, or you can think of it as one group. Your hamstrings. Nope. I don't have hamstrings, Gracie. I have pork cords. Those are never a sore. They're too damn big and strong. Not from deadlifting, yes, but not from running. And with that, I was going to say quadriceps, probably just all the leg extension. Nope. Calves. Yep, because my calves are incredibly small and weak, and I pretty much never train them. So, hence, whenever I go and do long style aerobic training, if you literally had me get on a machine where we just tested my max calf raise strength, which just sounds stupid, so obviously I haven't done it. And then compare that to like a leg extension, a uh, hip extension, and then like a, and a knee flexion. So look at hands, quads, glutes, et cetera. My calves will probably literally get stronger from long distance running because I neglect them so much in the rest of the time with my training. So yes, you can get stronger from aerobic style training and it's a great base. Everyone in theory should find an aerobic modality that they enjoy because it has positive effects on the heart, on our pulmonary system, on our blood volume, the capillarization being the one that's specific to whatever we're doing. But you've got to figure out, obviously, you know, how well trained the system is. And then whatever's the weak link, that's where you're going to feel it the most. So any other question you guys want me to field? Otherwise, we're good for today. Tomorrow is going to, or Wednesday is going to be mostly just a review. And it seems like everybody's doing pretty good with uh, figuring out the labs, especially since obviously the lactate wasn't able to go as one would hope. But uh, hey, we're doing our best with what we got. Are we good? Should we still um, turn in the lab number nine? Oh, yes. Turn in every damn lab. I'm not going to, no one's getting docked for being late. Just, just get this stuff in, guys. If you haven't gotten in already, those are meant to be more of the guinea points that, you know, hopefully is going to keep everybody in the grade they're looking to get by the end of this. All right. Well, guys, thank you guys as always for uh, coming. Have yourselves a great day and be safe out there, guys. Bye-bye.